connecting. Okay. What's going on, man? Welcome to uh, 40th Podcast. Hello. Thank you for coming on the show. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me, man. Good to see you again. Yeah. Mr. Ash and Eaton. And um, I don't know how many medals you got, man, but you got a bunch. That's, <laughs> well, that's, you, yeah. Go ahead. Well, uh, you know, I was, I was just thinking uh, of our, you know, one of the first medals I got was when we were roommates in... Uh, in 11? It, it, yeah, in 2011. Um, yeah. It was Daegu, and it was a very interesting experience. But um, yeah, it was, it was great, man. It was very fun. What was, what was interesting about it? You know, it's my first international competition, um, and I think my first kind of like feeling as a pro athlete like i'm here i'm at the world champs i gotta i gotta do stuff um and just the whole experience you know south korea was was way different than any place i'd ever been um and so the, honestly the whole thing was just weird and different <laughs> um but i was glad i was glad that you were there we were kind of like you know both in our headspace focusing in on doing our thing and uh I think we both have yeah. similar personalities and, and kind of quiet guys um but you know yeah can, can make light of things and so that was good keep things in perspective that's funny because like going into that championship for me i was uh i don't know like i don't want to say fairly seasoned but like at that point i'd been mm -hmm. i'd been post-collegiate for however long yeah. but that was my first championship with dr bonner chuck mm. so i came in like different with more uh with more confidence and, yeah. and honestly ability right um I had thrown 80 meters that year. It was yeah. like, this is, I was, I was going there to medal. Yeah. And, uh, and I didn't, <laughs> I threw, I threw like 75, 50 or something on my first attempt. This is in, in qualifying yeah. and the auto qualifying line, 79 meters. Okay. Yeah. Second throw over the auto qualifying line, about a foot out of sector. Third throw over the qualifying line roughly the same like it was almost the same hole yeah and yeah. like after the second throw i'm like yeah i honestly i think like i was i think i was fairly arrogant <laughs> in, mm -hmm. in terms of um should i have problem solved that a little bit better mm -hmm. um there's something that i would say like that's kind of in my in my career arc where like it's kind of just a go big or go home kind of thing like i don't i don't yeah. make many adjustments unless they're like absolutely necessary you know what i mean yeah you know that actually comes out in your throwing um yeah 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 totally i, I can really tell you know it's just kind of like this guy's gonna get in there and he's just gonna go for it every time yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's gonna be great or he's gonna die you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> so um yeah like that was a great experience and yeah and the asian countries korea was korea was really nice man it was just yeah aside from it being really hot but yeah yeah that's true anyway so um what are you doing now yeah uh i mean this this your podcast is 40th and so uh, i think it's very uh relevant you know i'm, I'm trying to rem remain strong <laughs> so I have a two and a half month old and um i think as all new parents know it's uh, just taxing um because one, I think you're learning a ton and just kind of trying to adjust and adapt and make sure you're doing things right and making sure that you're keeping this uh, human alive. Um, and then, you know, two, really as athletes, we eat, sleep, train. And I never understood how much um, the sleep portion contributed to the training portion. Uh, and I, I feel like as a professional athlete, we're a subset, a very small subset of the population that actually gets to experience um, insanely good sleep and like prioritize it in our career. Yeah. And now that that's like totally swung the opposite way <laughs> because you're just up with these guys, little guys all the time, um, you realize how much it affects you. So I'm being tough striving through. Um, but yeah, I, I've been out of sport for three years. So retired uh, since 2017. And the first year um, I learned, or my, my goal was basically just to explore the world. I knew I wanted to get kind of involved in, um, I didn't want to say business, but I wanted to join a company or work on something um, in the world that was just different from sport and contribute in a different way. And so uh, Brianna and I moved to San Francisco um, after about exploring different ideas for a year. And then- Our city, by the way, it's amazing. Yeah, it's an amazing city. And we, we moved here just because of like the science and technology, which has always been my interest um, in the startups, if you will. And then 2018, 
uh, we, I joined a software company and I thought software was interesting because there's many things um, that in, impacts today. And I thought, you know, if you want to have an impact a large scale, kind of this digital thing that you can release to folks um, is a way to do that. Ended up leaving because there's really, in my mind, two kind of buckets you fall in when you're, when you're working on something. You can be on the technical side of things and like on the product, if you will. Um, and in, or you can be like on the, on the business side of things, which is um, getting that thing into other people's hands and kind of analyzing the market, blah, blah, blah. And so I was more on the business side because I don't have a technical background and experience working on products. I just didn't like that. So I left and I went back to school and I'm currently kind of in school now uh, getting uh, marching towards a degree in uh, either engineering or physics. So, um, I, and then that started in 2019. And now I um, am doing that, but I also work at Intel. And okay. Intel has a uh, what they call the Olympic Technology Group. And in that group, they basically just try to make technologies that advance um, either athlete performance uh, or kind of the Olympic Games as a whole. And that could be from like a fan engagement perspective. So I met a person and they're working on a small team and what we're doing, and then they invited me to be on board. And what we're doing is, um, basically trying to we're creating a system that uses cameras to track athlete motion so we could set up a cameras around the hammer cage you could right. uh, do do your throw and we could basically give you back information about whatever you wanted because we get a, a 3d skeleton with key points and um, right. if you wanted to know how fast you rotated where your legs were what angle your arms were at all that stuff we can we can tell you and the goal is to basically get this in the hands of athletes could it tell you what do I want to know? Could it tell you the force through the body into the ground? Um, that, let me like, or is that, yeah. I mean, I don't know. Right. Cause like there are, there are places where you can have force plates, but like, sure. if you're telling me that you can do that without a force plate, like that would yeah. be like, oh. <laughs> I, yeah. I mean, you know, from a physics standpoint, force is mass times acceleration and we would basically know your acceleration. Um, so I, I'm, pretty sure that it's feasible we would just need uh your mass measurement <laughs> and so um you know you could just basically give it sense. give us that with uh right. with your with your weight and uh, we'd be able to i think actually derive that all right so we should probably talk a little bit more about this uh because <laughs> <laughs> i mean and and you'll and people hear me talk about it like i love like science technology and all that kind of stuff yeah. i think sometimes it, it depending on the conversation yeah. Um, it can cloud things a bit, mm. but it's not because it's not because it's, you know, bad, evil or like, you know, stay away. It's just like it, it just depends on the kind of conversation you're having. Agreed. Um, why I think it is so beneficial. And honestly, it's just flat out cool. Yeah. Yeah. It's, <laughs> because, it's you know, like being an athlete, like you are basically kind of a superhero. So like agreed. It's, it's see exactly how super, you know, we are. Yeah. I think from, you know, to follow on that the real insight I got as to why this kind of, I mean, essentially it's just information. Um, and I think what we do as athletes, let's say, um, and it's anything from like a gymnast to a hammer thrower to a diver. When you do an attempt, uh, you basically have a certain feeling that you get in your body. And before video analysis, like before we were able to watch ourselves, all we had was ourselves and a coach and our feeling. And you would basically, do the attempt, feel something and get the result, like how far the hammer went. And you have to connect the dots to that technique felt good. That hammer went far. My coach said it was good. That was a good throw. And I want to basically try to recreate that every time. Um, and so when you do attempt two and it's either good or bad, you know, you're trying to connect these dots as you go. What this technology I think would help with is what we're actually doing. So if you knew that you, you, did a certain uh, motion in your technique, the hammer went far, um, but you were also able to know, I rotated at this speed, I put this much force into the ground. Um, this is where my feet were hitting in the ring. If you were able to know that specific information and then on attempt two, also know that specific in information, you'd be able to start correlating and like connecting the dots even more. So it's like, oh, this, my next attempt, um, I tried something, I felt something, the hammer went less far and the data shows I was actually rotating less fast. Right. Uh, less fast, <laughs> not as fast. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, those are the kinds of things as athletes know when we are at practice 
we are really trying to hone in on, maybe we're thinking about two or three things, you know, let's just look at your footwork. Uh, let's just look at um, kind of your torso angle. Are you bending over, you know, keeping that core, right. uh, keep it, keep it an angle. So when you're, when you're focusing on these things, um, of course you're doing it, you're watching video and then you're kind of analyzing the result. But again, if you actually knew more specifically, it, I think it'd be beneficial. Absolutely. So <clears throat> I always, well, I don't want to say always, but like I tend to say um, to my athletes or any other kind of, you know, coaching thing that I'm doing, like the body is smarter than you are. Mm. So I think especially, and, and hammer, it might be a little bit like, you know, having thrown all of, all of them for the most part, I was awful at Jav. <laughs> Good job to you. <laughs> um, but I think the time under tension of hammer really allows like that feeling to come through. Yeah. So if I, if if when I'm saying um, the body is smarter than you are, what I'm really trying to say like is is to kind of trust what that feeling is, and if that feels good, chances are you are doing something correct, regardless of what it looks like. And I think. Um, a lot of times there's uh, there's dissonance there essentially where an athlete will feel something inside and then sometimes it'll feel bad and sometimes it'll feel good. Honestly, and a lot of times, especially, you know, the younger age athletes, they don't know what they're feeling. Yeah, they're still trying to figure it out. Athlete, yeah, right. But an athlete that does feel something and it's good and then their coach is like, because, you know, because it looked a certain way, like, no, you need to do this, right? Well, that completely takes them out of their intuition, right. basically what it is, right? Yeah. Because smarter in my opinion <laughs> i think that's a good point like maybe this idea of giving athletes a little bit more information about what they're doing would would actually just maybe accelerate their learning curve so when you're just starting out like i remember trying to learn the discus um and i didn't know what to, to feel you know because i'd never done it and yeah. so as i'm spinning and doing things um, i'm listening to feedback from the coach like yeah what you just did there do that more and i'm like okay now i need to internalize that feeling as is good like that, I need to recreate that. And so I'm trying again, and again. And um, I remember at one point I was getting frustrated and the coach is like, look, you just need more reps. Like, yeah, you're making a lot of corrections. Just like keep throwing it, keep throwing it. And I think what he was saying was you get that feeling from experience. And the, the, the more quantity that you can do, like you start here with quantity um, and then you kind of like start narrowing it down where you don't have to do as much for it to feel good. Like this one, you, you maybe yeah. get like one or two throws that you're like, oh, those went really well with all this quantity. And then over time, now you still get one or two throws, but you've only done four. Right. And um, maybe we can help accelerate kind of this narrowing of the good feeling with um, a little bit more information. Yeah, that kind of that. That's bringing me to a memory of. Um my freshman year with Babbitt and like, and I came out of high, if anyone see me throw disc in high school, they would be like, what the hell was that? And why did, it, <laughs> why did it go as far as it did? Right. So I came into Georgia, shall we say fairly erratic. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, as the months progressed, you know, of course things got better, but I remember like being on the field one time and him essentially saying that, right. We're like, yeah, right now you're at about, uh, you're at about like two out of 10, you know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. That are throws that are like either good slash like, you know, to his eye looked like it felt good to me. Yeah. Um, we need to get that up to about a, you know, a six. Well, I guess he probably didn't say 10. He probably said at a, like a one out of six, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I hear you. That's about a four out of six, five out of six kind of thing. And yeah. And like, I, like I really took that to heart because that was probably the first time I really understood. Right. Cause like once you get to college and then, moving on <clears throat> if, if your if your typical ratio is one out of six that means like in the threes is a high percentage that you're not even get out of the threes you know what i mean exactly uh, yeah so that's 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 really cool man we um you need any like <laughs> like i got you yeah i appreciate <laughs> it no that awesome very cool um so my intention like with this podcast has never been to just strictly make it about throwers yeah um, even though being a decathlete of course you throw so technically you are you still are you still are part of the, the cool happy people. to be happy to be part of the club <laughs> but um so uh, uh you know hopefully my 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 listeners i guess can can find value in this but 
For sure. Yeah, essentially, man. Like I'm, I'm after like the people who have the mind to, to, to get anything done. You know what I mean? So like eventually I'll start getting into like sports psychology people and probably some business people. Awesome. Um, but I, I want it. Yeah. I want it to kind of start there. So if you have any suggestions, hit me up like not now, but anyway. of course. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so how do you think, um, what do I want to ask right now? So you mentioned like kind of how things have changed like a little bit, like, are there, have you noticed any change like with, with, your um babe have you noticed any changes like in you right so like for me like when i tell people like it's totally cliche you always hear it before kids your life is totally gonna change blah 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 yeah yeah. but it's not really me speaking personally it's absolutely true like how does that work for you you know so i spent my whole life as an athlete um until i was basically 30 and um I think what that, I think from my spirit experience as an athlete, um, I just developed a certain mindset and like approach to things. And what that was, was um, it seems like there was always with sport, there's always a plan and a purpose. You're, you're trying to improve and you understand that like this improvement is very um, measurable. I'm either getting faster, throwing further, jumping uh, higher or farther. Uh, or I'm not. And um, I also have these milestones where there's competitions. So kind of like an end goal where it's maybe the Olympic games and you work backwards and there's, you know, there's just like structure. And, you know, having done that for so many years, um, I think that's kind of the way like my mind works and the way I operate. I, I try to create structure. I try to create like, these long-term goals and kind of have a, have a, have a plan and um, really try to make as much, as much progress forward as possible. Right. Um, when I retired from sport, there was no structure to what I was doing. Um, and I think in the kind of the business or the working world or basically kind of outside of sport, um, things are really ambiguous. Like you kind of have to create your own goals, your own, uh, um, like milestones, if you will. And if you actually haven't flexed that muscle of doing that, um, because sport, it is already very laid out for you. Um, it's actually, it's, it's tough to make that transition. Um, and so there's that component where I was in a structured environment and operating well, and then you get out of that, uh, structured environment. And even though you have a lot of tools to like make progress towards things, um, it's hard to operate when you don't know what to go towards. (laughs) So that athlete transition part was hard. And then you get into the situation now where I do have a young kid and, you are again are kind of used to being in a structured environment having a schedule um which we really try to maintain uh still as as um, retired athletes my wife and i uh now you have this um kid and their schedule is just you 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 just kind of don't have a schedule anymore (laughs) at least for the first two and a half the first two and a half months that's my experience and so um you're just trying to adapt to this situation and uh, really try to do the best you can. So I think where, where I'm at right now is I am trying to learn a bunch about, um, like through experience about being a parent. And uh, I think what's the biggest lesson is um, being just being able to adapt quickly. And I think this also comes from sport, but when the situation changes or when a little guy has an issue or something, um, oh, sorry about that. Right. Hey, Brianne. <laughs> um, when the little guy has an issue or something, then we just need to be able to like quickly kind of update our approach. Um, right. So an example of that would be the, we, we kind of had him on the schedule of like, let's say eating every three hours or something. And um, then one, well, like over a two day period, he, uh, he was, he was up and eating like every hour or almost constantly. And we were getting like no sleep and we were just like, are we doing something wrong? You know, he's just kind of crying and all this stuff. Yeah, yeah. We're just kind of like, oh my gosh. And then we, we I think we learned it was like a growth spurt or whatever. Yeah, and yeah. so it's just like, okay, now we're going to anticipate that and kind of be ready for it. Um, so it's just learning and adapting, man. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's, that's headspace I'm in. And it's, it's interesting because, um, I mean, it's, I mean, it's surrender. <laughs> yeah, no. Yeah, it is. It's, it's, it honestly reminds me of those little, 
um, and my sport is my frame of reference, right? The decathlon. And I try to, in any new experience I have, I'm like, where have I experienced this before? And uh, it does remind me of those early days of like learning a new event. I, I remember just, you know, you're always kind of, I wouldn't say failing, but you're always just kind of surrendering yourself to the process of, I'm not good at this right now, but uh, I'm trying to be. <laughs> Yeah, right? Because like most people want, eh, yes, most people want to be good. And so, yeah. you know what I mean? And it just, it depends on how. <laughs> or, at least, or at least better than they are right now, right? Exactly. And, but the process, I mean, learning anything new, right? Like friggin' trying to learn Spanish and. <laughs> exactly. It's just not clicking. Like I know me personally, cause, and, there, and there's lots of things that I'm like me super, um, patient about yeah there's other stuff where you know i'll probably just have a complete freaker and it's like it's like the most <laughs> most random thing that you would be like oh, dude are you serious like chill out yeah um, it's a it's a challenge yeah for sure it's, it's definitely a challenge and, and where i think it's interesting now um speaking about having to adapt like in this way and comparing it to sport is of course like the virus going around now right yeah for sure athletes for better or for worse are having to make those changes but then there's also so as athletes i think we are trained or at least told and and taught to about adapting and making the best out of situations right right um but i don't really believe most do that very well okay and, yeah and you know and there's nothing wrong with that be because within the sport, I think we're taught that, but on, on the flip side of it, like you said, there is typically a process that for the vast majority of us competing now have never had an interruption like this one. You know what I mean? Yeah. The last yeah, yeah. one, war two. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Last like global, like, no, we're done. We can't do anything. You know what I mean? For sure. And, um, and I think that starts to really show, right, where you know, an athlete knows when their championship is, they know where their competitions are, they know what their plan is going to be. Mm -hmm. and having to do that now is, is a bit of a struggle for some. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, as an athlete, my philosophy was always and I actually learned this from the uh, 2011 World Championships where we were roommates. Because oh. uh, I also didn't really have a great competition. But um, the, the philosophy is like, I think struggle equals growth. And I think um, facing this challenge for athletes will trigger a kind of like mentality shift or a lesson learned um, yes. that I think might actually benefit them quite a lot in the future. And I think that lesson basically is um, how to deal with uh, expectations and uncertainty. And so when you have these expectations of how you think something should go. I think very rarely does something go that way. Yeah. Um, and, and, and it actually is like the outcome is there's so many factors. Like if you just go to a competition and you're like, I want to PR or I want to like do my best or whatever. Um, there's so many factors that play into that. Whether um, what somebody else does, maybe, you know, an official is like on your case about something and you're like, getting distracted. Uh, maybe your coach can't get into the stadium because, you know, they lost their credential. So there's just all kinds of things that um, could affect your performance. And it's actually less, I think, successful, being successful is less about, um, I don't say it's less about, but I think it's more about being able to deal with those uncertain situations mm -hmm. um, better than others. Yeah. So if you take a subset of a hundred athletes and everybody's in, you take them in this situation, some will be successful, more successful than, than others at um, going to Tokyo 21 and kind of adapting to the situation. And the question is why, why is that? Like, what are they doing different? Um, and I think it is that quick adaptation that like, Oh, now I also all of a sudden have to make a change and being okay with that. And to your point, athletes are very used to prescription and uh, the set schedule and like a, real, a set plan of action. And yeah. when that is getting disrupted, all of a sudden it's like, oh my gosh, <laughs> now I don't know what to do. <laughs> so, yeah, and it's crazy. And you can, I mean, you can just tell by how people talk. And, and I would say personally on my journey, like, 
hearing like in the last couple of years, hearing those things, like it used to essentially just kind of, you know, upset me or piss me off or whatever, depending on what was said. Yeah. But now, now like you can, I, you can still hear and identify when, when that's being said, mm. but like, there's a lot more from me, there's a lot more patience and like, I mean, and that's okay. That's just where they are. You know what I mean? And then, cause yeah. ultimately you can't make them do feel or whatever a certain way about a situation. Right. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. An athlete saying, oh, no, this is the worst thing ever. Um, right. Now I'm never going to, you know, compete or something like that. It, it might work, but it's less effective to go to that athlete and be like, bro, it's fine. Like, you'll be good. Just, you know, take a chill for a little while, wait for the, the virus to blow over, and then get back to training. Like, they might hear that, but for the most part, like, that's for the athlete to kind of sit and be like, yeah, this will be fine. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, that's, that's when the change happens. So, I mean, talking about like the, that aspect of things, how, how does an athlete get to the level where they can change that? You know, how do they go from um, accepting like the situation as it, is, as it is and kind of being disappointed about it to flipping and saying, okay, this is what it is. Um, I'm, I'm going to like figure it out and sure. not let it affect me in a negative way. Yeah. I mean, so like, like you said, struggle. So I think struggle is that, um, is, is that moment. And and there's really, you know, there's really two ways to go, but I'm sure there's a couple others. Right. And so you can, you can have that growth, Mm -hmm. but I think the, the issue that comes up there is like, I think there's a lot of people out there depending on their um upbringing and their personality and you know what i mean their own societal structures or whatever right when they when they reach a point to have that struggle sometimes like that that struggle or that uncertain uncertainty as you said like that kind of equals death (laughs) yeah i see like in a sense you know what i mean so like inside it's like mm, and 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 i know just from you know again and like reading and, and following things like most of the time they don't even know that that's happening. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's just a matter of kind of, which is easier said than done, but I think being in those situations and continuing. Yeah. Well, what I will say about that though, is I think asking questions. Yeah. Right. So if, if, it, if, if you come to that situation and you're aware enough to ask yourself the question, you'll be better served than to come to that situation and just simply react. You know yeah. Right? Yeah. Agreed. That was nice to think through that. Thanks. Yeah, no problem, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But y'all, go ahead. Well, I just, I think the asking questions part is um, really paramount. Uh, and because the result of asking a question is pursuing the answer. And I think that's really the, the, the important part of asking questions. And when you pursue answers, you typically try to uh, gather information, right? And deduce from that information. Um, what's like true or not, what's kind of like useful or not. And then from that, make your decision on where, on what to do. And so if you're asking the question, like what, you know, in this situation, what can I do to like basically still uh, be better than somebody or like get to the Olympic games ready to rock? Um, you know, the, the answer they might find is like, you know, my, my training situation has changed a little bit, but I can do X, Y, and Z still. Um, and, you know, maybe start preparing, like when things do open up, I'm going to look at the competition schedule and I'm just going to like start clicking down what makes sense for like a new, um, like a new season or like a different season timeline. Um, so anyways, I think asking questions to your point gets people on the path a little bit quicker. Yeah, not, yeah, exactly. And that's the best way to put it on the path where, uh, versus, not asking questions and, and, and prescription. Do yeah. It, and like and sitting around waiting yeah. for things to come to you, right. You're like going yeah. to get things. <laughs> yeah. Um, and that, and that, and I think that's, that's why I'm so fascinated. That's why, you know, this is four days podcast. And, and my thing is mindset because I think like what we're talking about, anyone can do, it's not oh, just a sure. it's not a track thing. You know yeah. what I mean? <laughs> it's not a business thing. It's a, it's a human, yeah. it's a human thing. Perfect. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I completely agree with that. Um, so have you, 
I feel like, so like in our conversations, I think we tend to get, um, I don't know, I don't want to say deep, like for lack of sounding, <laughs> but like fairly, right? Yeah. And, and so my, my question to you was going to be, um, have you always thought this way, but then, or like, have you always kind of approached sport and training and you know what I mean? Like your mindset mm-hmm. in training this way. And then I kind of thought like, I mean, I, I, you probably have just based on. Yeah, it's a good question. I think I have, well, first let me, the way I think is, um, you know, actually, I guess I, I ask uh, kind of a fundamental question and then I try to start answering it in a certain way. And I remember being eight years old and um, I think I had seen Mike Powell do the long jump uh, and I was watching on TV okay. and I was like, that's insane. You know, I want to try to do that. And so I grew up in a small town um, and uh, so I just kind of like went outside and it was, we, you know, we lived out in the woods a little bit. And so I went outside and I grabbed a couple tree branches off the ground and I set one branch down um, and then I walked like three or four uh, or five paces away and I set another branch down and I went a little ways back from the first branch and I ran up and jumped from behind it and tried to clear the second one. So, you know, I was doing like my own little mini long jump and my, my little thing, I was like, how, I was like, how far can I jump? And to me, the best way to answer that was like, you know, just kind of keep like trying to move that stick. And so yeah. I remember for like hours, I was outside running and jumping in the dirt and trying to like move that stick further and further and further. And uh, I remember I would, I would run, jump and clear it. And then when I had like the mark in the sand where I landed, I'd move the stick to that mark. And then I'd back up and like get a profile view and I'd see like how far that was. And I was like, man, I wonder if I could, you know, I wonder if I could go even further. And so I'd like go back and do it again. And I would like do anything to try to get just a centimeter. And, you know, because I was out there for so long, um, at some point, like I'm not moving the stick very much. I've like capped it out. And I remember I'm like running, I'm jumping, I'm like holding my knees to my chest and I'm like landing <laughs> on my side just to like get anything to go further. And um, what, when I reflect on that, when people ask me about my mindset, um, it was, I think what that is, is like, I love, I'm really um, interested in like the capabilities that we have and like exploring what those are and like, what just like moving something even if it's just a centimeter like Mm -hmm. just moving the needle and um as i grew up and kind of like uh, did more sports and other activities in my life um, that kind of same theme was clear like how do we keep moving forward and i like the idea or it feels good or that you know the whole moving forward concept um or just like making progress if you will is something that's really attracted me and uh I think, you know, I, I also did martial arts and in martial arts, there's belts. And I just loved that process of like the next belt, the next belt. And like when you ever, you completed or did a test to go from your yellow to your green, I was excited because I was like, now I get to learn like all the green belt stuff. I'm like, I've yeah. leveled up, you know, I'm like going to the next level. Yeah. And I think it's just this idea of like going to the next level that I'm fascinated with. And um, what... I think the result of that is, and I think why I was able to, well, so to answer your question, I think I've always thought this way of like, how do we get to the next level? Um, how do I personally get to the next level? And like, what is that? What's my limit? Um, and yeah, I think that kind of mindset really contributed to my success as an athlete. And uh, I do, I do find it now that I'm outside of sport. Like I think the same way about like business or projects or products or things that were like, I'm trying to create. Um, it's just like, what's the next level of this thing? Because whatever we've currently done is obviously possible. We, we need to kind of move towards the horizon and advance that horizon, um, you know, for the benefit of others. Right. Yeah. Um, and that's really cool because like, just listen to you talk that way i i think it's like like it's really clear like that's that's not um it's more like it's kind of intrinsic i guess right like it's something Mm -hmm. that you already yeah had and i think 
like, um, so to the point of earlier saying like everyone can do that, while I absolutely believe that's true, I also believe that there are people that either just have it, right, or you know what I mean, or it just comes at an earlier stage than than others. You know what I mean? Being a agreed or whatever. Yeah. Uh, so like, yeah, man, like like hearing that you were doing stuff like that. Cause, I mean, yeah, I don't think I did that. <laughs> I mean, well, I had. Like, you know, yeah. I also spent time in karate, and I did kind of enjoy that, but like not really. And you know, so thinking about like activities as a as a young one, then yeah. I was I was the saxophonist, which I thought I was really good at. Yeah. Um, what else? I did t ball and like pee wee football. I ne- you know what? I never did like track. Not until really. Grade. I didn't do like little yeah. little little dude track. You know what I mean? I think I remember I was talking about this. Yeah, that's impressive. Um. Yeah, well, you know, the, the thing that sport taught me also about kind of like going to that next level or keeping, keep trying to getting, uh, keep trying to get better is that um, the, the biggest strides you make are actually from the, the failures or the challenges that you have. Yeah. And I think one of the main reasons is because when you end up kind of, let's say you're in a situation and you, and you win or you do something awesome and you get like a good outcome, in those situations, you tend to leave it not thinking about how to improve as much as you would have if you failed. Because <laughs> you're thinking like, okay, what did I do wrong? Um, or how can I be better? Or I messed up on this and that. And I'm going to go back and change it. When like winning is actually really bad feedback compared to losing, in my opinion. And so um, when you're always trying to push your own limit, um, I feel like you're always on that kind of like failure and losing uh, and just challenge front. And um, I think sport is what helped me understand that because there's, I think certain things in life where you just, maybe there isn't a next level. It's just kind of like, um, like a stasis or you, you just kind of like stay in this certain area, but with sport, it's always about uh, faster, stronger, higher. And so um, it's I mean, there's, like, there's always a level because there's always, cause it, because there's a result. So even right. if, exactly. you know what I mean? Like in, in, in your case, right? You're a world record holder, um, but even though no one else in the world has ever done something like as you've done, right. you still have all of your own personal results that exactly. you were all, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah. and, and that's something that I totally get, um, because I mean, that's exactly what I would do. I, you know, I, I know I've had situations where like, you know, you would win something and then, you know, being interviewed after and I'm, you know, all athletes get this. This is not just a me thing. And like, and the interviewer like just can't understand if you seem to be like down or disappointed or anything else. And they're like, you just want, I'm like, dude, it's not just, it's not just about winning, man. Like <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, was, I, was, I was after <laughs> something. Yeah. I was trying to PR. I was trying to feel something. I was trying to, you know what I mean? Yeah. I was trying, yeah. So um, what I like about what you just said, and I'll speak from a hammer perspective. Yeah. Um, the, the winning not being the best teacher. Sure. Um, from a hammer perspective, for the most part, all of U.S. hammer throwers that were amazing excelled mm-hmm. um, in high school. I won't say all. For the most part, until very recently, for the very most part, they didn't do very much in the senior ranks in terms of A, throwing far, B, making teams, and also having success internationally. Right. Um, and in recent years, the ones, I mean, and then, you know, Rudy and Connor are, are both tops in the high school ranks. But before them, all the ones that were, you know, amazing at Hammer in high school didn't really um, get to those levels. Yeah. Um, but it's, it is very nice that Connor and Rudy are doing that now because the, it, because the, the conversation is always there. Man, these guys are really good. If they can just stay in it long enough, and right. that's the thing. or if they can just kind of get through these periods, right? And, and you know, now there's like Hammer Initiative and now there's um, um, Talent Protection. These, there's these initiatives that are in place to kind of help, right? To, yeah. to put that gap. Um, it would be interesting to talk to them. I don't know if you already have about like, you know, how they've, what they felt how they made that transition that some athletes can't make. Right. Well, and yeah, and that, and that's just it. Um, 
so typically, so whereas th those were, you know, the, the, the winners and the ones that won a lot in high school um, didn't make those ranks, but the ones who, A, like myself, never even really knew what a hammer was, mm -hmm. <laughs> or the ones that didn't throw it far, those are the ones that typically are in the top 10 of the U.S. And now, and now again, Connor and Rudy are in the top 10 as well, but um, yeah. You know, it's, I got a late start in decathlon too. Of, yeah, like dynamic versus like who basically had to just survive. To right. Get versus the ones who won a lot, faced some of that adversity and are like, mm. yeah. <laughs> you know, I got a late start in the decathlon too. I wonder if there's something to that athletes kind of um, starting their career or being introduced into something later, later, um, and and being you know a little bit more successful than those that had kind of had success early. Because I do believe it's a rare story for, I think, for sure. I think so, yeah. Um, but, you know, actually, it's it, maybe it's just a, a track and field thing. Um, I don't know if it's like because of how technical it is in some of the events. But um, if you look at basketball, many athletes actually kids like recruited out of high school. Right. So that could just be a size and speed thing. I don't know. Well, the, yeah, now that we're, I mean, if we can play this out, maybe it's probably about money, right? Because, you know, True. you get to college and things are, are fine. They're good, right? But then yeah. as soon as college is over, you know, unless you get signed to a fairly big contract, it's just going to be hard for a while. <laughs> yeah, no, that's true. And, 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 you know, and I'll tell people, like, there's nothing wrong with that. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, if, if the, the big boy decision is made to leave the sport, you know, you, you do what you got to do. There's, there's nothing wrong with that or stay in the sport and then yeah. and suffer. And there's nothing wrong with that, too. Right. Uh, and hopefully you don't have to suffer for long. But again, you know, suffering is yeah, pain and suffering and suffering is awesomeness. I don't know. <laughs> Make something up on the fly didn't work. <laughs> there, you know, there's an awesome book that I read um, that is, a, I think, a good articulation of the mindset um, that I try to have. And it's written by a Canadian astronaut. Um, and I think he's the first Canadian to go to the space station. Okay. And his name is Chris Hadfield. And it's called The Astronaut's Guide to Life on Earth. And what he basically um, wrote is his mentality and like how he approaches, um, how he approached being an astronaut and like what it required to be successful in that. And it, were, it sounded just like sport, honestly. <laughs> it was, uh, each chapter was um, titled something that was extremely relevant to, to an athlete. Nice. I just, yeah, I just remember reading that being like, man, that's really, that's really good. So when did you, when did you read that? Was this during the career? It was, um, it was actually after I had kind of come to some of these conclusions on my own, but it was good to just see kind of a, you know, a little <clears throat> bit of validation, but I think it was 2014 or 15. Interesting. So in, in that, um, um, what was I going to say? Well, so a, a couple topics back, we were talking about your, the mind, kind of like the mindset and, and where it kind of spawned from, from kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. And, and I'm interested in um, when, when you needed that most, like in your career. Well, I, I do want to apply that specifically to career. I, I'm sure you needed it in life as well. And maybe you yeah. can get into that if you want to, but like in your career as, um, high performance athlete and, and medalist, like when did you need to, to, you know what I mean? To call on that. Just like my mentality, like the mental approach being, yeah. mm -hmm. okay. Well, basically in 2011 in Daegu, I, um, it was my first world championship team. And to make that team, um, uh, I had to go to like the U S trials and, I was, it was my first year as a professional athlete. I was fresh out of college. Um, I just signed my shoe contract. And so the, the situation was one where I was like, hey, I'm this young athlete and I just got signed. I'm like doing my first US trials. Um, you know, this is awesome. And I feel great, I'm ready to go. And I ended up scoring really well in that competition. And I think I was like the best in the world by 200 points. And so now there's all these factors lining up where I'm just like, I'm going to go to my first world championship. I'm already the best in the world. Um, I just had one of my best competitions ever. Like all I need to do when I go to Daegu is exactly what I did at the trials. And I'm going to win like my first 
uh, gold medal. Uh, you know, this is going to be awesome. So there's it's like some arrogance there, actually, I think. Yeah, I've been saying, yeah. And like being naive, for sure. Yeah. And so I had this basically expectation in my mind, which was, here's what I did at US Trials, and I'm just going to do that again. And I'll win. Um, so when I got to Daegu, I'm it, like getting ready for the 100 meters. And in my mind, um, I'm thinking, okay, all I have to do is run this fast. And I remember the gun going off, and I started out of the blocks, and it was one of those starts. It was like one of the best starts of my life. I remember just seeing people like go behind me. Like they just disappeared from my vision. <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh, you know, the first five meters, I'm thinking this is going to be so fast. And then the gun fires again. And I was like, so disappointed. Uh, you know, I didn't fall start, but somebody did. And I was just like, that was going to be my fastest run of all time. I know it. I know it. So I'm kind of walking back to the blocks and I'm like, okay, whatever. I can, I can do this again. I'm getting in the blocks. Um, and I'm still kind of like jittery from the one I just did. And they say set and the gun fires and I'm like, not ready. It was, you know, I'm thinking it's going to be the same as it was before. And it wasn't, it was like a little bit faster and everybody just goes like this in front of me. <laughs> and uh, I'm running down the track, like trying to get time back. And um, I end up basically not running that fast. And I'm thinking in my mind, this I've already like derailed my plan. I'm off course from what I did in the trials, which means I'm off, off course from winning. And from that point on, I started freaking out. Um, I go into the long jump and I'm like, okay, because I was slower in the hundred, I actually need to jump this far, which is like further than what I thought. So I go into the long jump. My first jump is like so far. We actually have a picture of it. I never jumped eight meters and I'm over the eight meter line. My coach like had a picture. It was like the best jump of my life. And it was a foul. And I'm just thinking, Oh, like, come on. I just missed it. Did my, my second jump. It was absolutely horrible. A foot behind the board. It was like 7.4 meters, like 24 something feet. I jumped further in like my freshman year of college or something. And then I found my last jump. And so now I'm like, I've lost it. This whole competition I've lost because I haven't hit like these check marks and I'm just done. And this actually happened almost every single event because I had these things in my mind that I need to achieve in order to win. And basically we get to the javelin, uh, you know, it's the, uh, the second to last event before the decathlon's over and I'm like ready to go home. I remember sitting there and just staring at the wall in kind of the restroom before, uh, before the competition. And I'm thinking, I just need, I want to go home in my entire life as an athlete up to that point, which had been like 20 plus years. I, I never had that feeling of wanting to leave someplace, uh, while competing. And my coach came to me. And he said, Ashton, I know you're like struggling during this competition, um, but I just want to let you know, if you run this in the 1500, you have a chance to get a medal. And I was like, really? I, mean, I thought I was out of it. I thought I was like, just send me home. I'm not even in the, in the running here. Um, yeah. But I was, I was still in the running. And so I ended up running a time and getting uh, the silver medal. And that experience opened my eyes because I remember standing behind like the silver medal stand. And I was like, I totally screwed myself up from the first event. Um, I was in the game still, but in my mind, I had taken myself out of the game because I had these expectations that I wasn't hitting. And so the very first lesson that I learned um, almost, you know, before I was even on the plane home was you got my, my expectations. Uh, I have to reverse it. I had my expectations and my aspirations were the same. I wanted to PR and I expected to PR and they, they actually should be opposite. What I should do is aspire to PR but expect that all hell's going to break loose and everything's going to go wrong. Mm -hmm. Because what yeah. you, what you, what you do to fill this gap is you, you completely change how you approach things. You actually, all this gap, the, the gap filling is preparation. So from then on, my training was one where um, at practice, I would prepare for every bad scenario. I would practice, um, tell my coach, like, let's do some hundred meter starts and then, you know, fire a full start gun you know, just put it in there at some point. Like, don't tell me when, just put it in there. So I'd always be ready for false starts. Um, I prepared by like throwing discus and, and shot and doing that kind of stuff in the rain. Yeah. Um, I did pole vault when it was crosswind or headwind. And like, you know, wind is a big factor in uh, track and field for a lot of things. And it's like, the wind is never going to be perfect. We should, we should practice for all the crap scenarios. Um, and so uh, you know, from, from 2011 on, I actually never lost a competition. And I think it's because that's the way I started approaching things. And so 
from that point, it helped me in my entire career. <laughs> and so uh, when it really came into play, though, was in 2016, when I was, uh, well, it came into play actually in 2012. It was raining. It was the Olympic trials. Um, I'd never been an Olympian. And my whole goal was just, I want to make the team. I don't care if I get first. I just want to be top three and make the team. And um, the conditions were absolute trash. But I was so, it didn't matter to me because I had prepared in all those scenarios. And I think that really contributed to my success there. Um, but then, yeah, the final point was uh, 2016 Olympic Games. I uh, had three, oh, excuse me, two fouls in the pole vault. And it was a very low bar uh, for me. And uh, basically, if I were to miss this next thing, um, no medal. Uh, and it's just kind of like my career is, is over um, with kind of like a swan song type of thing. And I just remember sitting there thinking like, all this, you know, every negative scenario I've been here through has prepared me for this. Um, and I don't know, I just felt like a lot of confidence. And I just thought back to all the the times um, during training that I had purposely kind of put myself through um, a hardship to face this exact scenario where I could be freaking out, um, which I kind of was, but uh, at least I had a plan. Like I was, I was confident in my approach. Yeah. Thanks for sharing, man. I feel like giving you a standing ovation or something. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's just, uh, it was this, and again, it's like, that's why I feel as if the, the losing portion is so critical, especially when you're younger, it's okay to lose. It's, it's so critical to, uh, you know what? That actually might answer the question of why people who have success in high school struggle later on. Because if they haven't had those, like, if you're always winning, if you're always the best in high school, like, what are you actually doing to experience the uh, trials and tribulations, uh, you know, the trial and error necessary in, in order to face losing? And then by the time you get to college, or whatever, you are going to lose, <laughs> like, and it could be by a lot. And all of a sudden, your whole worldview is screwed up. And your expectation of what you could do or what you should be doing um, is totally blown up. And if you can't respond to that, that may be, you know, the reason why it's, it's hard. Right, because I mean, like, very rarely, well, in track and field, I could, I could bring up like, you know, basketball and LeBron, but my, my point is like, very rarely in track and field is someone always going to be the best at every yeah, level. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? And just continue to be the best as they progress. Like I, someone might, some statistician, st statistician might be able to find that. Um, but like right now, just thinking about it, like, I don't, I don't think so. Yeah, um, yeah. And that, yeah. And that's, that's part of the journey, like being able to feel and I guess absorb all of those struggles and, and, and basically turn that joint into gold. Like that's kind of, that's what you got to do. Yeah, I think so. Um, I'll share a similar story. And that was 2016, right? With the pole vault and... Yeah, 2016. Final, so, final competition ever. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, it was. Um, so I've, I've had, you know, however many mentors and, they, and they've all been amazing. So mm. what I'm going to speak about now is um, Coach Bob McKay, Coach Mack out of, at the time, Moore Park uh, yeah. Junior College. And we had a lot of lessons. So he was in the military and he was in the Marines and, wow. and a lot of that. So like we got yeah. a lot of lessons on that front. Yeah. Some might say maybe a little too hard. Some would say, <laughs> you know what I mean? No problem. Yeah. Uh, I was, I was fine with all of it. I don't remember thinking or saying anything and being like, and, and I think I got it. I got it pretty good. Not as, not as bad as his son Lucas did. Um, but like that kind of goes without saying, I think when, when yeah. um, anyway. And so we did spend a lot of time, like if he knew something that would freak you out, you can guarantee you're going to see it. You know what I mean? And like, That's and good. the lesson was you need to prepare yourself for, that right and so in a southern california it rarely rains and when it does people are just like yeah no i'm not gonna practice today you know what i yeah. mean yeah yeah um at least in the throws i don't know about sprints and stuff um but we didn't do that and and because it didn't rain that much he we would well he would make us go do it we would go get some buckets and throw the water on the thing yeah on the ring and then and then have to throw right but the other thing about southern california is it doesn't rain very much so they don't know how to make rings that are halfway decent and uh. 
Yeah. So, you know, and, and I never forgot it. He was like, cause I was probably complaining or something. I'm like, I don't want to do this. Or uh, maybe I was, I was probably feeling good and not wanting to, you know what I mean? Throw in that, that variable on a day yeah. when I was feeling good. Yeah. And, um, and he was like, what's, what are you going to do if it rains in the Olympics? Right. And, and like, you feel good. <laughs> I was like, yeah. Right. And I was like, I don't, I mean, I guess I'll throw like, you know what I mean? But it's at that time when you think about it and it's like, yeah, whatever. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, I don't remember what happened with the rest of that practice, but we fa- and this is probably 2000, this is probably 2002 ish. Okay. Um, fast forward, <clears throat> finished my degree at Ashland. I'm with Judd for however long. And that experience was amazing. Go to Dr. Barnerchuk. That experience is amazing. I do end up kind of knocking on the door of all of these goals that I moved there for. Right. Get to London in the qualifying rounds first throw i kind of went after it yanked the crap out of it it's a foul it's a sector foul yeah whatever mm-hmm. second throw they called a foul on me that i didn't think was a foul but whatever and so we go to protest it or i go to get the mark frozen so we can protest after and um and then i go and sit down <laughs> and then like right as i sit down and put my stuff back on it starts to rain. <laughs> so I'm at my first Olympic games after doing all of these things to go put myself in a situation to have the best kind of career and results that I felt like I could possibly have. Right. Um, I'm sitting here. I've got two fouls. It starts to rain. Got a flashback to the 10 years ago. <laughs> it's flashback to coach Mac. What if it rains in the Olympics? Well, damn it, dude. It <laughs> All right, then. And, um, but so like you said, I was filled with confidence and, and like, it was just, no, I got this, right? It was just, you know what it was? I would call it just calm. Yeah, yeah. And, and just kind of annoying that like, and, and by this point I was throwing, I was throwing fine and I knew I felt pretty good. Um, but I sat down and then I'm just kind of observing things and the stands are packed, right? This is 12. You were there and it, yeah. was, it was amazing. Wonderful. And, but then you start to see athletes like just kind of freaking out how athletes yeah. do when things change. And I'm like, yeah. Yeah. Whatever. And so I hop in for my third throw and also standard me, but just get after it. Like, yeah. <laughs> I didn't yeah. get there and like try to try to get enough stick because it's yeah. random so I can so I can do the thing I, I got in there I do I did everything normal and I got in and I threw it it was a season best I qualified fourth or fifth or something into the final it was fantastic yeah. it's but it's awesome. like it's one of those things that I'll talk about that uh, and actually I should probably include this I got to do another talk in a week or so um yeah that uh like it really came through and those are one of those moments when like at the time when the when the um I don't know when the lesson was first brought to you it's like it's it wasn't standoffish but it was it was kind of brushed aside you know what i mean for sure um but i will say i did always carry it with me it's just one of those things where like but you know what are the chances it's gonna rain at the olympics just because you say what if it rains at the olympics (laughs) yeah i mean the most amazing part of the story is like you were able to recall that and have it affect you 10 years later it's just like yeah, in the moment, which is just like an insanely, um, yeah, I think it just shows like the power of how important those things could be. You know, you do it once or however many times you did it, but you remembered that moment. And it's like, oh, I've been through this before, even though it was like a decade ago and I'm ready to rock and it made you yeah. successful. Um, yeah. It reminds me actually of, uh, I was watching this show with my wife, uh, Brianne, last night and it was, it's called um, Saving Jaws. And it was about this uh, biologist whose whole like life purpose is to save uh, shark populations. And when you were talking about how when it started raining, you got a, a sense of calm or you had confidence and you had a feeling of calm. It reminded me like this lady is out here swimming with sharks like all day long. And a person who has never had that experience, you throw them in the water and they would just be freaking out. Um, but it's because they just haven't been through it before. Yeah. Like, yeah. She's yeah. calm and confident because she has an understanding of the situation. Like she knows what to do in, you know, if a shark starts coming at her or she knows like the nature of sharks and all this other stuff purely because she's just been through the situation. 
which is interesting because like yeah this is cool <laughs> yeah i mean it's the same thing that you're saying right it's like yeah I'm and thrown in the rain it's awesome. like not a big deal yeah and like uh i would say like animal instinct right like they can tell like they have a sense about that like you you absolutely draw more attention to yourself at least in their environment mm-hmm. when you're like Bleh! when you're shifting like kind of freaking out about something right and yeah um whereas if we just kind of chill and not to say it always happens but yeah um but i think also in human nature it's like that too like if i think about like when i played football you can always tell that one that was like mm, just a little yeah. bit unsure yeah. um and they would be the wink wink right and i think that probably happens i mean it absolutely happens in track and you probably honestly see it within track and field i imagine you would have seen something like that uh more often because not only I think you guys are probably closer together and then especially like athletes. Yeah. 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 Um, but to be able to see, not, not that you take advantage of it per se. I don't know. I'm sure some of you did, but like in the throws world, for instance, like in the eighties and nineties, there's, there's some stories of guys just straight up trying to screw with guys. I don't know <laughs> if that happens nowadays. Uh, I don't know. I don't think it happens uh, nowadays, but I do think that there's advantages that you can take that, um, you see, and most of them are, are frankly um, based on mentality, like a mental approach. Because mm-hmm. as athletes, especially in decathlon, you know that there's always physical uh, advantages and disadvantages. People are better than you at something, and you're better than them at yeah. something. And so, you know, kind of you get your edge that way, but that's sometimes set in stone. Where you really get your edge is how you approach it. And so, uh, you see athletes who sometimes they have two fouls and they've they haven't practiced that scenario in practice where it's like um hey we're going to practice long jump today but you have two fouls and so you need to get on the board you know and when they don't have that you kind of see them kind of like i don't know what to do because i haven't been here before yeah um yeah yeah um what was your favorite throwing event oh well i never got to do hammer so yeah. Unfortunately, I can't rule that one in, uh, but it looked sweet. Um, I think you did pretty good, man. You got that power power to weight ratio. I think. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think uh, when it went, honestly, they were all awesome. I, in in both in all three the um, chop the discus and javelin, I've had experiences where it just went. I think how it should, mm-hmm. where I hit a position i threw the implement and it felt like it just absolutely jumped out of my hand and you know the distance uh, showed that as well like they were the furthest those i ever had and sometimes they're in practice but i was just like i swear to you that's how this event should be done that's like yeah and um when the shot put did that it was unbelievable the feeling it felt like you're throwing a a uh, a bowling ball like a mile just popped right out of your, it was almost like it had legs just popped right out of your hand um same thing with the javelin you would throw it and it would fly and it would be like an extra few seconds of staying in the air nor. And it was almost like it was floating. You're like, normally it should be falling down right now, but it's still staying up there and it's <laughs> unbelievable. <laughs> um, and then finally with the discus uh, would be situations where you would throw it and you'd almost see it. You, the trajectory you thought was going to be one thing. And it was almost like it, it flew out of your hand. It kind of just like went up, just kind of popped up, and just caught more air. And uh, honestly, all those feelings were amazing. <laughs> that's what I talk about, man. Like, I think that's, I think there should be more emphasis on what is being felt because if it feels good, yeah, I'm t- chances are like you're doing the right thing regardless. Yeah. Of like, it was, <laughs> yeah, it was, it was awesome. Do you have any regrets about any particular event? Now you can say any of the 10 or the 23 that you've done. <laughs> I think that, yeah, I think, um, uh, I wish I would have spent more time on the pole vaults. It's a really fun event. And I think I had more potential there. Um, I wish I would have spent more time on the discus. It was an event that, um, I mean, I, I spent a lot of time on it, but I think really could have contributed to me, um, fulfilling more of like my potential in, in scoring. Um, I think also in the 2012 Olympics, I should have, uh, and I think even in the 2016 Olympics, I should have 
given more on my 1500 meter runs, my last event. And the reason I didn't was the main reason I didn't was because I was always concerned that those were the, some of the longest and most stressful competitions that I've been in. And sometimes in practices, my body would just like my calves would cramp. I'd feel unbelievable. And then uh, I'd be running an interval and, you know, they would just seize up. And uh, I was always concerned that if I went out too hard in the 15, I would feel great, but something would happen. That was like almost kind of out of my control. And so I was always just trying to mitigate that by taking it uh, just cautiously in the first couple laps. Um, Do you ever have like, you know, signals or signs that that was coming or was it just like a complete, you know? It was just, it would just come out of nowhere. And uh, eventually it boiled down to actually a nutrition problem I learned later on. Um, and yeah, I think lack of sodium, essentially. Some athletes need more than others. And so uh, once I started uh, basically putting more salt on things and kind of um, just putting more sodium in my diet when I used to sweat a lot, um, the problem went away. But I was always still a little bit concerned about it. And when you have something like the Olympic Games and Olympic medal on the line, you, you really try to mitigate risks. And so uh, I, I just regret not being a little bit more aggressive because I felt like I was just holding back and that's not necessarily my style. But I always thought winning was important too. Yeah, that's a... Uh... <laughs> That's, that's tricky. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think if I was just a 1500 meter runner, then it'd be no question I'd go for it. But because the decathlon is like this big, long two day thing. And you know, at the end you could like basically have all this work mean nothing. <laughs> it's like, um, yeah, in my mind, that's just, that's just how I approached it, I guess. Yeah. Right. On. Um, so we've kind of touched on Brianne. She is Canadian and Canadian chicks are awesome. I'm of course with one as well. Um, Absolutely. Um, right. So you guys met at Oregon. That's right. Are you, you're not the same age though, or, or are you? I mean, you're older. She's a year younger. You're older. Okay. Uh, yeah. So like basically kind of what I'm getting at is like, what, um, did you notice any changes between like, you know, pre girlfriend slash fiance mm -hmm. wife as a, mm -hmm. as an athlete to after? Um, I think the biggest change I saw in her, so we got married in 2013 and we started dating in 2008. Um, I think the biggest change I saw in her was actually in 2012. And so she's oh, always been, are... say again. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We were together since 2008. I was, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, basically she's always really been the same athletes, but I think her approach changed after the Olympics in 2012. So she ended up getting 11th. And after that, she went to our coach and was like, I uh, am not doing sport. How did she put it? She basically was like, do you think I can get on the medal stand? And he said, uh, because if you don't, then maybe I'll think about doing something different. Uh, but if you do, then we need to change some things. And because uh, I don't want to do sport to kind of like not try to fulfill that. And he just started laughing because <laughs> I think it was just like the determination in her eyes about like where she wanted to be and, and really the truthful feedback about where she could go. And he just started laughing. It was like, Brianna, are you ready to work? <laughs> and she said, yeah. And so from that point on, she literally was like so laser focused on all aspects of her, her training. And, you know, I, I saw the progression throughout all the four years from 2012, 2016, of you know, spending extra time at practice on the technical aspects because in, in decathlon and heptathlon, it is physical, but it's it's just so technical across the board um, for all the events as far as like how to improve. And so she knew that she was lacking in a lot of areas. And I think her her challenge to him and herself was like, "Do you think I have what it takes to basically learn these things and get it done?" Um, and so uh, yeah, she did everything. <laughs> She did sports psychology. Uh, she took her nutrition insanely seriously um, and did whatever she needed to do in training extra or, or sometimes even cut back, which was honestly the hardest part. If an injury happened or like a little niggle was coming on, the hardest part was her like not going to training um, and just saying, I need it to take a day off. And, you know, listening to the coaching and the physios saying like, stop, the best thing you can do right now is rest and trusting that. So her, her yeah, mentality sounds, changed then. Yeah. 
She sounds a lot like Crystal, which <laughs> yeah. Yeah. should really be should really be surprised about. Um, uh, I forgot what my follow up question there was going to be. What did, what did she do growing up? Was she, did she happen? Did she do figure skating or hockey, even for that matter? She, I think, did a little bit of hockey, but then she stopped when um, girls were forced to go into. Um, and, and women have like a different kind of hockey. I forget what it's called. At a, um, after a certain age, yeah. Yeah, and she was like, I'm not, I don't want to do this. This hockey sucks compared to the other one. Yeah. <laughs> I was playing with the guys. Um, and then, maybe, it's, maybe it's the helmets. There's a certain, yeah. Yeah, they, something hey, like that. Like, it's just like different rules. I think it's like slower, and she's like, it's slower and not as fun and like less athletic or something. Um, so she did that for a little bit. Uh, she grew up in a small town, you know, I think as most people do in Canada. And then uh, – what that afforded her was like, she did all the sports. So she did a lot of track and field. She played soccer, she did basketball. She was really always doing everything. And um, she did focused on track and field after 2005, when she went to, I think a, a Pan Am junior game in Morocco or something. And she was like, wow, I can do sport and travel the world and like maybe even get a scholarship. Like I'm definitely doing this, so. <clears throat> yeah. So I think what's what's interesting that maybe not a lot of people get to experience is having two people, like uh, like a couple who are both involved in sport at whatever the level happens to be. But let's say like you two as a couple, and then myself and Crystal at a at a you know domestic and international level. Mm. What those conversations are are like outside of track, right? Because like yeah. Like we've had days where like she'll be in a bit of a freak out. There'll be days when I'm in a bit of a freak out or just pissed off. You know what I mean? At yeah. at something like how like did you guys um, did you guys work well in those situations or was it like once we leave the track we're not talking about it? Like what yeah. did you guys do? Every day was different, but we ended up. Um, I think it was like a process over time of learning how to communicate. And mm-hmm. in the beginning, um, the communication method was hey, I saw you do struggling at practice and doing this wrong. You should try doing this. <laughs> and the other person, you know, if they were in a mindset of like, I just had a horrible day. Don't tell me what to do. Like, yeah. I don't need your feedback. Um, that's typically how it went in the beginning on both sides. So yeah. she would, like, I always struggled in high jump and she was really good at it. She's like, what if you tried this? What if you tried that? And I'd be like, literally, stop talking to me about high jump. <laughs> yeah. um, and in her, with her in like the shop under the throws, I'd be like, you should try this, you should try that. Over time, it, it, we understood each other's kind of like um, situations and, and how to communicate and really be more supportive rather than like fully critical. Um, but then also when to be critical, it's like, look, I know you're, you're having a hard time and your mindset is like kind of negative right now, um, but here's the critical feedback. Like you are not doing X, Y, and Z. And you know that you need to do that. We both know that. Um, so outside of sport, like we would come home and we'd either, you know, talk about, Hey, is this a day where you want to figure it out and talk about it more? Or is this a day where it's just like, leave me alone. I don't really care. Is uh, the last thing I want to think about is the crappy practice I had. I'll come back to it later. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it took a lot of time. I mean, it took, I would say like a year or two to, to be, to a point where our conversations were like productive rather than destructive. Yeah. Yeah. I know, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but once we got uh, to that point, it was awesome because we could have struggles um, and we'd know exactly what each other needed to hear and really help. Yeah. So I wonder what that's like, like when it's just the one event, right? Crystal also did hammer. Um, yeah. So one shared event versus, uh, I don't know, seven. what is there five <laughs> probably shared events between? Yeah. Or is it oh, seven? Yeah, we share, well, the, the women do seven. Uh, maybe six, right? Because you don't do 200. No, but, I, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, um, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty good here. Maybe. Yeah, I got to jump off anyway, but. Okay. So uh, um, are you still involved in sport? So you... I am. I am. Um, and part of the athletics association that Christian Taylor started. Okay. Um, which is basically trying to unify the athlete voice and kind of get um, the sport of track and field 
one, get information about where it's headed from like the people who are governing it, uh, the World Athletics Federation being one of them, um, and then understanding what athletes want to do uh, and see changed. So that's in progress right now. And then um, I'm part of a group of decathletes that we've all kind of gotten together as well, uh, and heptathletes, excuse me, multi event athletes. Uh, we've all gotten together as well um, to talk about the future of the sport and like how we can have a positive impact so dang that sounds kind of cool yeah um all right so um thank you thank you so much for coming on here man um if you have any final words that's great is there anywhere like people can find you social media wise and um you know i'm only uh on twitter ashton j eaton it's like my only social platform um but yeah man it's, it's always a pleasure to talk to you it's good to good to see you again and uh, thanks for having me on. All right, man. Cheers. Thanks again. Yeah, dude. Good to see you. And uh, enjoy Easter. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, huh? Yeah. All right. Say to Crystal. I will, man. Bye. Take care, man. Bye.